John 3, 1. I'm reading in the King James Version. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born Again, the wind blows where it listeth, where it wants to. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. I'd like to speak to you today on the subject that Jesus gave us. You must be born again. God bless you. Please be seated. Thank you for standing, worshiping. And entertaining the presence of God. John 3. It's amazing that some of the most incredible words spoken by Jesus were spoken to one person. John 3. John 4 is the woman at the well. John 3 is this man Nicodemus. And it is a crucial conversation between Jesus Christ and this man named Nicodemus. In this conversation, Jesus sheds light on God's plan of salvation. We learn in this passage that salvation cannot be earned. Salvation cannot be obtained by your mental assent, merely making a decision for Christ. Salvation is not based on your background, your culture, your upbringing, your heritage. Salvation is a gift from God and it is realized by a spiritual birth by being born again. You must be born again. John chapter 3 contains perhaps the most familiar verse in the entire Bible. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, since being born again is the only way to enter the kingdom of God or to see the kingdom of God, Jesus uses both words, we need to explore this story to see how you can be born again. Because Jesus said, you must be born again. Who is Nicodemus? Let's read these verses. We're going to review what we read as a text. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, to understand the story, you need to understand where Nicodemus is coming from. And to know where he is coming from, you need to know who he was. Nicodemus is a Jew by birth. And he is affiliated with the Pharisees, one of five major religious sects that existed in the days of Jesus. So he's a part of the Pharisees, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Zealots, and Herodians. But you hear more about the Pharisees than the Sadducees. The Pharisees were very conservative. They were highly organized. And they were politically connected. The Pharisees unlike the Sadducees, believed in angels and spirits. They believed in a bodily resurrection from the dead. They also tended to believe as a group that they were just a little better than you. They believed that they were 
righteous and because of that they were self-righteous and they were condescending very often. Many of them had a holier-than-thou attitude. And I don't know that Nicodemus personally had that kind of a syndrome of superiority, but he, he's a Jew, he's a Pharisee, and he's a ruler of the Jews. We're told that he's a ruler of the Jews. Now what that means is that he was a member of the ruling Jewish body called the Sanhedrin, the 70. They possibly have their roots all the way back to the days of Moses, at least in principle. But here is Nicodemus, a Jew, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. There were 70 men ruled over by the high priest who made the 71st man of the Sanhedrin. They wielded immense influence and political power. In the time of Christ, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem enjoyed a high measure of independence in the way they ruled in Jewish life. They exercised not only civil jurisdiction or in religious laws, but to some degree they got involved in criminal cases. The Sanhedrin had administrative authority. They could order people to be arrested by their own authority. They had their own officers who were part of the arrest of Paul later. They were empowered to judge cases that did not involve capital punishment. But if it involved capital punishment, the putting to death of a convicted felon, then they had to get the Roman governor involved. And if you understand that, then you can remember in the story of Jesus that Jesus went before the Sanhedrin. He went before Pilate, the Roman governor or procurator, back and forth in what was really a kangaroo court or an illegal trial. But as a rule, the Roman government, the Roman governor, tried to appease what the Sanhedrin wanted out of political expediency. So if these 70 men ruling over Jewish affairs, if they knew that it was popular to do a certain thing, then the Roman governor was likely to go along with it. Now Nicodemus is a part of these 70 men that have great authority. But he's very sincere. He's waiting for the kingdom of God. And he comes to Jesus by night because he knows that it could cost him dearly if anyone knew that he a Jew, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, went to this teacher, this outsider, this rabbi named Jesus. So he comes at night. Now Nicodemus, I just want to tell you now that his discipleship toward Jesus increases. Later in John chapter 7, he defends Jesus and says, does a man judge a person before the evidence is presented? I'm paraphrasing in John 19, it is Nicodemus who comes along with Joseph of Arimathea and claims the body of Jesus, brings the spices, and buries Jesus. So he is an open disciple at the end of the ministry of Jesus, but not at the first. He comes to Jesus by night. He's sincere, intelligent, but he's also pretty savvy. He knows that he better be careful about his interaction with Jesus Christ. And it's interesting to me that when he comes to Jesus, he says, Rabbi, he acknowledges him as a teacher. We know, we, the Sanhedrin, we that are in charge, we that have it all together, we that are kind of taking care of things around here, we know that you've just got to be a teacher come from God because no one can do the miracles that you're doing unless God is with him. So what Nicodemus is saying is we know who we are. We're in charge. But we really can't figure out who you are. So I've come to just ask you a few questions. I don't know that anyone sent him. I don't think they did. But he wants to kind of figure it out. Now he tells Jesus that the Sanhedrin knew privately what they would never admit publicly that Jesus had come from God. The miracles that Jesus did authenticated his identity, who he was. We know. The year teacher come from God. Now Jesus answers Nicodemus in a way that has him really bewildered in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus is processing this, 
And he's really asking himself the question, what does that have to do with what I just said? Nicodemus doesn't really ask Jesus a, a direct question, but he asks him a, a kind of an implied question. Who are you? And instead of saying who he is, Jesus says, you know what, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus is really concerned about this, doesn't understand this, and he's very confused because he does not know what is wrong with his first birth. After all, he's a Jew. He's of the seed or descendant of Father Abraham. And the Jews believed that they were entitled to the kingdom of God because of their first birth. They are of the lineage of Abraham. They are God's chosen people. He's been born right the first time, so there's no need to be born a second time. Now, I've seen people who say, well, I was raised in church. I'm a good person. I've never hurt anybody in my life. What they're really saying is what Nicodemus said. You know, he implies, what was wrong with my first birth? How do I need to be born again when I was born right the first time? And I just want to say to every one of us today that it doesn't matter if you were born and raised in the church. It doesn't matter if you were the founding member of any church. If you've not been born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It is impossible. Nicodemus is sincere. He's a student of the word of God. And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. Now, verse 4. Nicodemus saith to him. I want you to see how much of a disconnect there is between what Nicodemus says and how Jesus responds and what Nicodemus is thinking. He has not been born again. No one has to this point. Only into Acts chapter 2. So he is unregenerated. He does not have spiritual understanding, although he is a religious leader. And he says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now this is proof that even a religious person, a sincere person, and an intelligent person is capable of asking a dumb question. Right? It's impossible for an adult to re-enter his mother's womb and be born again. Now, I don't think this is an arrogant question, but it is an ignorant question. He's trying to make Jesus maybe look a little foolish. But I just want to pause here to say that I have heard some intelligent, educated, unregenerated people ask some very foolish questions. And with an air of arrogance, as if they knew something you didn't know. But I have learned that arrogance and ignorance can coexist in the same cranium. And Nicodemus is certainly intelligent. He's not a, he's not a foolish man, I don't mean that. But he doesn't get it because he doesn't understand spiritual things. So Jesus... Runs it by him again with a little more insight, John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, most assuredly in the New King James, I say unto thee, except a man or woman be born of water and of the Spirit. Now he defines what being born again means. It is to be born of water and of the Spirit. Jesus says he cannot... Enter into the kingdom of God. Then he explains why. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Amen. Unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells us, that there are two components to new birth. The first is water and the second is spirit. And it is very much like being born the first time. That first birth of a natural birth 
is a birth of water and a birth of the Spirit. When a baby is born of the water, the water breaks, the baby exits the womb, and new life begins. But that is not all that happens. There is also a spirit birth, a breath birth. If the baby does not take a breath, it will die. So being born of spirit or breath alone does not make you alive. Excuse me, water alone. Being born of water alone does not make you alive. It must be water and spirit. Amen? It is spirit that is the breath of life. Amen. Now, in John 3, 5, the word spirit comes from a Greek word that is pneuma, like pneumatics, and it means wind or breath. It's a very powerful word. Jesus tells Nicodemus that you have to be born of water and of the spirit. And it's true that when you're born again, there will always be these two components. Now, I want to do a fast forward, and I'll come back to Nicodemus. When was anyone born again? When, what, when did it happen for the very first time? So you've got to go through John and you go to the book of Acts to the day of Pentecost. It is there that the church was born on that day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, in an upper room, and then everywhere in the streets. So Jesus had given the apostle Peter the keys to the kingdom of God. He's going to use a sermon to open access into the kingdom of God. He's going to preach words that tell people how to be saved, how to be born again. There's no disconnect between John 3 and Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is how John 3 takes place in a person's life. When the Holy Spirit was first received, it was accompanied by supernatural signs. Peter's got this sermon he's going to preach. And as he preaches to people who have just witnessed people speaking in tongues for the first time ever, they marvel, they're amazed, they're in doubt, they have questions, so the Apostle Peter preaches. And at the culmination of his sermon in Acts chapter 2, 37, those listeners ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? We recognize that we are guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ by rejecting him and having him crucified. Now what do we do? And the apostle Peter tells them what they should do to be born again, to be saved. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Now that's the start of the new birth experience. But that is not part of new birth that is part of the death of your old life. Because you, before you can be born again, you need to die to your old sinful self. You have to ask the Lord. You must ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins, to confess and to forsake your sins. Repent, the apostle Peter said. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. This very clearly, is the birth of water. It is being born of water to enter the kingdom of God. And he said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the birth of the Spirit. Water and Spirit. And Holy Spirit, in Acts 2.38, Spirit, Holy Ghost, it is that same word, pneuma, that means spirit that God has used throughout the Bible. Amen? I'm so excited that I understand this. Amen? Just like you hear the cry of a baby. When a person is born again of the Spirit, you hear the sound of speaking in tongues come out of their mouth, a language they have never learned as they have entered a brand new life. Amen? As the Spirit gives utterance or the ability to speak. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. You must be born of water and spirit to enter the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38 is the application of the death, burial, and resurrection to your life. It is how someone is born again of water 
and of spirit. And Nicodemus doesn't hear Acts 2.38. He only hears what we call John 3.5, John 3.6. And Nicodemus, who has been born naturally of the flesh, doesn't get it. Jesus explains why in verse 6. Again, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So here's what we need to understand about being born again. That it does not matter how you were born the first time. You were born naturally. You were born of the flesh. And all being born of the flesh can produce is just more flesh. You may be a good moral person, but you cannot save by just being a good moral person. After you are born again, you should be a good moral person. But you can be a law-abiding citizen. You can be like the Good Samaritan and help lots and lots of people. The Bible said you can give your body to be burned. You can do whatever you want. But unless you're born again, you cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. Because that which is born of the flesh is always going to be flesh. It cannot be anything else. It might be really pretty flesh. Or handsome flesh like yours. It might be really intelligent flesh. Or even talented flesh. It may be what people call royal flesh. But guess what? It's still flesh. It's not regenerated. Not born again. Spiritual word regenerated. It's just flesh. And that's all it will ever be. And that's why Nicodemus in this conversation cannot comprehend spiritual truths even though he's been born of some really incredible flesh, a Jew, a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin. He's kind of standing there and his key word is duh. Duh. I don't get it. Jesus says in verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee you must be born again. And then Jesus gives a little more insight into being born again, how it happens. When you're born of the Spirit, Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it wants to, wherever it listeth. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but that, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. I've seen some amazing things happen in my life. I've seen people that prayed and prayed and prayed to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and they were so close and it took them forever. But I have also seen someone standing to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and it was sort of like the wind just blew by. And one minute they were praising the Lord in English and the next moment they were praising the Lord in another language that they had never learned. The wind, it just blew by and they were filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus says the wind just blows where it wants to. You can't quarantine it. You cannot control it. We would love to control hurricanes and tornadoes and bring them under the power of man. But Jesus said that you cannot control it. Solomon wrote about the wind in Ecclesiastes. He said it, it blows south. Then it turns north. It goes around and around blowing in circles. I have a cool app on my phone that shows wind circuits. And I'm intrigued to watch how the wind blows around the world. And Jesus says, you cannot stop the wind from blowing. Amen. The word of God is not bound. It can blow behind any kind of a political system and access challenge nations and prisons. Amen. In a heart that is all broken and messed up. Amen. The wind blows where it wants to, Jesus said. When God created Adam, there's Adam, a lifeless lump of clay, right? In the form of man. But then the Bible said, Genesis 2 and 7, that he breathed, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. I hope you see the pattern. That in Genesis, God breathes into Adam the breath of life. He becomes a living soul. When Jesus is resurrected from the dead, the Bible said he is a quickening spirit. Amen. But at new birth, something similar happens to natural birth. I love the story of Ezekiel 37. 
valley of dry bones. God takes Ezekiel there and tells him to preach, prophesy over those dry bones. And he, he prophesies and they come together bone to his bone and they kind of gather up as, as a person, sinew, flesh, but they're just laying there, lifeless. But then God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind. And say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain that they may live. So Ezekiel said, I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. I want to tell you that there's nothing more incredible in the world than the breath of God coming into a person who's trying to do good, but they're just flesh. And the Holy Ghost comes and breathes spiritual life, eternal life into them. Oh, praise God. And we, we need a revival of the Holy Ghost in our nation. We need it in our lives. Otherwise, we are dead and dry. We may be born again, but we're still living like we're not. And that's why Paul said, if you live in the Spirit, if you've received the Holy Ghost, let us also walk in the Spirit. Toward the end of his ministry, John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus gathered his disciples. And the Bible said, you know, Jesus did some things that were sort of silly, like spitting on the ground, putting his finger in a man's ear. His disciples were standing there. I don't think they had COVID. And he breathes on them. I don't know how he did it, so I can just do it however I want. The reason I believe it was and not is because on the day of Pentecost, it was a rushing mighty wind. So he said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now they didn't receive it right then, but he was giving them a clue about what would happen when they did. And on the birthday of the church, when people were born again for the very first time in human history, they were all in one place, in one accord. And suddenly, Acts 2 and 2, and suddenly... There came a sound from heaven like as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Amen? And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them. Amen? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When? Amen. That's how it happened. On that day, 120 at one time. And then by the end of the day, 3,000 more people. On the first day of the church, 3,120 people were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were born again of water and of the Spirit. That's what happened then, and that must happen for you. You must be born again. Now, I want to just finish the story in just kind of a summary fashion. Nicodemus, he says back to Jesus, how can these things be? You see where he is? He still doesn't get it. How can these things be? I don't understand at all. And Jesus answered and said to him, are you a master in Israel and you don't know these things? And Jesus expresses, we can only talk about things we know. And I've told you earthly things and you don't even get it. How can you understand spiritual things? Jesus is kind of rebuking Nicodemus. He's having a crucial conversation. He's confronting him about his spiritual blindness. He's basically saying, you, Nicodemus, are Reverend Professor Dr. Nicodemus. And you don't get this? It proves the point that Jesus is making. Is it flesh? Just keeps on producing more flesh. Whether it is an idea you have 
or something you think you're going to do like the people that James spoke about who said we're going to go to a certain city and buy and sell and get great gain but James says you better pray you better say if the Lord will he doesn't say pray there if the Lord will in other words he said no matter what it is in your life we are spirit filled people and we need to be led by the spirit not by the flesh amen So let me ask you a question. Have you been born again? Have you been born again of water and of the Spirit? If not, the words of Jesus are very clear. That you cannot see nor can you enter the kingdom of God. Translation. You cannot go to heaven. There's only other, one other place to go. And that is hell. And there's not a third eternal destination, just two. If you were born of the water, baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, you're on your way to being born again. And if not, maybe you've been coming to our church, perhaps you're watching online right now, and you've never been baptized in water, that means immersed In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want you to know that we're ready to baptize you today. We believe that the need of being baptized is an urgent need. In the Bible, they did it in the middle of the night when a person repented of their sins and believed on the Lord. They didn't wait till tomorrow. They didn't do it once a quarter on baptism Sunday. They did it when people were ready and repented of their sins. I'm not against emphasizing baptism, but in the Bible, it's right now. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. 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 Baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. So so we keep our baptistry clean and warm year-round, day and night. We have changing rooms, baptistry garments. We have people, if you're watching online, you can email us at connect at awpc.org. We'll arrange to baptize you this week. And if you live somewhere else, we will find someone to come to you or we'll let you meet them at a church somewhere, anywhere in the world. We'll find a way for you to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We we believe it's that important. You may be sincere and walking in all the light you know, but the Bible gives you more light. And today you know that you must be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So do it today or as soon as possible. Amen? Amen. Water in the name of Jesus Christ. We're ready to baptize you today. And if you have not received the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you have not received the biblical plan of salvation of being born of the spirit now right now but i'm a good person i go to church i covered that with brother nicodemus good godly man like apollos who was mighty in the scriptures but didn't understand the full truth about salvation like the disciples at ephesus in acts chapter 19 they were very sincere but when they heard the truth They didn't put up a defense mechanism. They willingly obeyed because they were sincere and they wanted to enter the kingdom of God. These are questions you need to answer. Have I been born again according to the scriptures because Jesus said you must be born again. There's a young man that just call him D for today. I have his name and know him. He was born in Minnesota. Moved to Georgia when he was three years old. His mom and dad were always splitting up. So he came down here to Georgia to live with his dad. He grew up in a house of people that went to a traditional church. He went to church, but he never felt like he had become a Christian. And then in his teenage years, the experiences of life and peer pressure and Temptation led him away, and he got involved in drugs and alcohol and a lot of promiscuity, and he was arrested a few times in his teenage years. After he turned 21, he realized he wasn't who he wanted to be. He started going to a church with his dad. He got in a program, but it really wasn't working for him, and 
So one night he was out with some friends and uh, he, he bought some alcohol for some underage students. They're driving in a car. The driver was under the influence, swerved uh, and flipped the car at least two times. And he, in a panic, ran from that accident, afraid of the consequences. He was the only one, 21, who had purchased the alcohol. Later, the police found him, came to his house, put him in jail, and later he went to prison. He was in jail and in prison for a total of 38 months. God was dealing with Dee's heart. When he was in jail, God was working on him. He got in a Bible study. He tried to apply the word of God to his life. He had a really filthy mouth, so God convicted him of his language and he tried to clean up his speech and then God began to convict him of other areas of his life and he repented of his sins and he was trying to change his life to do what was right. He was repenting and God was cleansing his heart. He was reading the Bible, but it wasn't making full sense to him. It seemed like it had a lot of contradictions. Right before D got out of prison, he had a vision. And in his vision... He was in a church, and there was a man that was operating a camera on a platform, and that man was speaking in tongues in church. He saw this in a vision. Well, D got out of prison on April 9, 2014. He visited a couple of other churches, a few other churches, including two apostolic churches, but a month out of being out of prison, he came here to Atlanta West. And the first Sunday that he was here, the vision that God had given him in prison came to pass. During the church service, there was a message in tongues and an interpretation. And the man who was operating the camera on a platform that we used to use was named Ray New. He has since passed away and gone on to be with the Lord. And he gave the interpretation that said this, that was specific to this young man, D. The Lord said through Ray New, Today, I will fill you with my spirit as long as you are obedient and will do all that I tell you. People, he said, started praying and worshiping. And people were coming to the altar to pray. There is a man that D did not know. It was his first time here. But he said, I've never seen him again. And that man came to D and asked him to come down to the altar to pray. When D got here, he was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues for the first time in his life because God gave him the new birth experience. He had been baptized in Jesus' name before he came here, but we baptized him again. Because he wanted to. I thank God for the power of the new birth experience. Please stand. I saw this young man I'm calling D today. Only because I didn't get his permission afresh to tell his story. He was here a couple months ago. He brought his wife. He brought baby, maybe two children. Living for God. Changed life. What a split home could not do. What drugs and alcohol and promiscuity could not do. Try to destroy this young man's life. What a near fatal car accident could not do for him. God had his hand on his life. Saw somewhere down in there some sincerity and led him to truth. Amen. There were times when he was coming here to church, which was for quite a while. He would be depressed and discouraged. There were times when he had setbacks in his life, but he never gave up. And God has kept him and blessed him because of this new birth experience. I think you know this, but this is what we live to see. 
This is why we have a church. This is why we are, we are a church. We don't exist for any other reason than to see people come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and then watch them grow into fully devoted followers of Him. That's why we exist. And if you know someone who has not been born again, even though they're a good person, they may be a church person, they may read their Bible through every year, they may teach Sunday school, no matter who they are, in spite of their good intentions and their sincerity, the Bible does not give anyone a pass for disobedience to obey the Word of God. And if a person is sincere, God will reach them with truth. You don't believe that? Read the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. He's leaving Jerusalem, the most religious spot in the entire world. He's come to worship the Old Testament God. That's all he knows. He's reading the Old Testament scripture. But because he was sincere, God took Philip out of a revival in Samaria down to the desert to preach to one man how to be saved. God will get a messenger to you if you're sincere. Don't ever discount the power of God. As he works through his word. Amen. So today, if you've not repented of your sins, today would be the best day in all of history for you to repent. Yesterday would have been better, but today's good day. If you've never been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, specifically having the name of Jesus called over your life, before you leave today, let us baptize you in Jesus' name. If you'll tell someone we're ready, we have a team of people that are ready to baptize you today. They can explain more about it if you need that. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit means the same thing. Today the Lord will fill you with His Spirit. And if you're a Spirit-filled person, or you're living beneath the privileges and power of God, why don't you be renewed in the Holy Ghost today? Don't live your life living like an unregenerated person when you have been born again of water and spirit.